However, he started his own unique badge in 1927, two years after, after starting the ZCC, and he required his members to wear the badge in public whenever they left their house, which generally speaking is still the same rule today. However, I will tell you that many people who are members do not wear their badges at all times. Okay, so there's more people out there <laughs> than you would think. Uh, even I've even met some really top people, you know, who don't wear them. It's not that they're not. It's not that they're afraid to wear it. It's just that they'll say, "Well, I, I can't just be totally defined by one movement. I, I'm more than just being a member." So they, not everyone abides by the policy. However, the vast majority do. Okay, hopefully, hopefully they're settled down now, all right? <laughs> yeah, hi. No, hey. no problem, no problem. Yeah, I think uh, we shouldn't waste any more time since you're a busy man now. No, we no, you know what? I'm okay till Wednesday. Then after that, another tough week. But um, no, man, don't worry. I've had a terrible time recently or a very rough time, but I'm feeling good today. Okay, great then. Uh, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another video. And uh, this is part two of our three series uh, video regarding ZCC, its history and practices. So if you have not watched the part one, you do not have the right to be watching this one. Uh, so please pause and go back and watch the first one. So today's video will basically be dipping, uh, digging into the ZCC in terms of theology, practices, and uh, all uh, their, their beliefs. And uh, who's the better man than uh, Dr. Barry Morton to be with me? Uh, Dr. Barry Morton, today, how's you that side? Doing great, Percy. How are you today? I, as well, this side, I'm doing fine. Uh, as a way of uh, introduction in terms of who you are, is it enough for me to say that you're Dr. Barry Morton, you've done a lot of research on the ZCC, and uh, you've been in South Africa, you've been in Botswana, or do you want to add more to that? No, that's fine. That's that's the crux of the matter right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, without any further ado, uh, let's get into it. But before we discuss the theologies, the practices, I think uh, it is better to start at... Uh, any important questions, uh, some of the research, some of the findings regarding this tends to, to vary. And uh, that is, when was ZCC founded? When was it established? And uh, in terms of structure during that time, how did it look like? Could you please help us with clarity with that? All right, sure. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation about when the ZCC started, but it started on a very specific date, which is 16 September 1925, when a group of people met uh, in Pretoria in one of the townships, and they had a big meeting, and they decided to, over the course of a few days, form the ZCC, and Enginus Lechanyani invited many fellow-minded people to break away from their churches, and 926 joined him. Uh, in September 1925, and we know this because the very next day uh, he sent a delegation of people to government to the government offices in Pretoria asking for official recognition. So it's very clear, although the ZCC likes to say that they were founded in 1910, it's not really true. Yeah. Yeah, and with regarding to that, I mean. In the, in the first video, we touched on the missionaries that were around uh, Mamabolo and other areas. And uh, these were Protestant, the Presbyterians, 
and typically they tend to report and document a lot of things. So when it comes to the Zion Christian Church, are there any uh, reportings, documents that can be found regarding Lihanyane and the ZXCC and the early ZXCC? Uh Generally speaking, they wrote very little down about him, um, especially during the first 20 years or so of the ZCC. Very few missionaries made any comments. There were a couple who talked about him very early on, but they don't say a lot. And I think the reason is that the early ZCC was scattered. It it had, depending on what you source you use, less than 20 congregations. And so each congregation was small. And as the group as a whole didn't seem to be very big or important at the beginning. So they didn't attract a lot of commentary uh, initially from anybody. So... Generally speaking, when you look at the first oh, 10 years, seven, eight, 10 years of the organization, you, you have to go on memories, oral history, or things that were written down later rather than anything coming out at the time. Okay, that's it about uh, the history in terms of when ZCC was uh, officially founded and also in terms of the reporting and documentations that were expected from uh, the missionaries. So with that, let's get into what this video is all about. And that is uh, the beliefs, the practices, and the theology within the ZCC. And I think an appropriate uh, question to ask you, Dr. Barry Morton, is uh, regarding the visions. Uh, what role uh, did visions play in the life of uh, Agnes Lehanyane? Well, I think a number of people um, have noted that visions and prophecy really lie at the heart of ZCC theology, which has never been laid out in any kind of official document, by the way. Let me say that. Um, if you don't have the visions that were received by Enginus and his sons, then there's nothing unique about the ZCC. So a lot of most of the critical um, beliefs and cornerstones of the church are based on the prophecies received by this the leading members of this family. So. Uh, I guess the most important ones would be the visions that led them to be called as prophets to South Africa. Okay, or for Enginus believed he was called as a prophet. Some of this information, I think, started to be talked about more publicly in the 50s and 60s and was not there at the beginning uh, about Enginus is called to be a prophet in 1910. Uh, I'm not sure it was there at the beginning, but later on, it was asserted much more by both Star and Dove that about the 1910 prophecy, his calling that he had. Okay. And then in addition to that, another major prophecy would be Lechanyani's vision on the top of the sacred Mount Tabahoni in 1924, when he was at the mountaintop and some leaves fell into his hat from a tree, uh, which he maintained was God calling him to gather the believers into one church, the hat representing the new ZCC and the leaves would be the followers. So those are two of the cornerstone prophecies uh, of the ZCC. In addition, the other one that's of major importance is visions in which God told Lechanyani that in the beginning, uh, he created the sacred mountain, Mount Tabahone, to be the special place, the place where he had planted a flag. And this 
place where he planted the flag on this mountain, the church that was to be based around that mountain, this was to become the biggest and most important church in the world. So I think those are three of the most important prophecies in the ZCC. There's many others, some of which are contradictory and have different versions, but I think those, those are the founding sort of principles of what makes the ZCC different from other Christian groups or other Zionist groups. And also the, that, that one of uh, England, uh, him uh, prophesying about England and the war. I, I'm not a person of history. Did that really actually happen? Um, okay, the, you have... In 1917, when Enginus was a lower level minister and he hadn't formed his own church yet, he prophesied that England would defeat Germany in World War I. Many ZCC believers point to this early prophecy, which predates the founding of the church, as being evidence of his ability or his connection to God to foresee the future and to provide evidence that what he's saying is about his mission is true. Okay. Um, I have no idea other than oral tr tradition. Nobody ever wrote about it at the time. It's an oral tradition. So I assume that he made it. It's a 50, you know, it's a 50, 50 guess, I would say. And uh, he was correct, and he gained a lot of fame amongst people in that circle of believers for his prophecies. And there were oral tradition says that he made a number of other prophecies that came true, although it's not exactly clear what they were. Uh, and that this ability to foresee the future, apparently he had, and many people believed it for Enginus's entire life. Um, yeah. So they went to him to seek, he was constantly besieged by people seeking advice for what they should do in terms of their personal problems. And then he would pray with them and give them the right advice he saw based on his ability to foresee the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, let us move on maybe from the visions and the prophecy but uh, another things which kind of uh, makes uh, ZCC unique is this uh, uh, wearing of badge you see people just all over uh, old young people ladies men in buses you know at school at workplace uh, in corporate everywhere they just have this stuff and uh I mean, if a visitor comes in South Africa, might start wondering, what is this? And uh, so maybe we can get some history and uh, where did this idea of wearing a badge start and uh, what, what, what does it mean? Okay, well, I'm not sure it means any one thing in particular. I think it has a range of meanings. Um, I think... The wearing of badges was begun by Zionists on the Vidvadasrant when Enginas first moved there uh, as a young man, as a migrant worker. Um, however, he started his own unique badge in 1927, two years after, after starting the ZCC, and he required his members to wear the badge in public whenever they left their house, which generally speaking, is still the same rule today. However, I will tell you that many people who are members do not wear their badges at all times. Okay, so there's more people out there <laughs> than you would think. Uh, even I've even met some really top people, you know, who don't wear them. It's not that they're not, it's not that they're afraid to wear it. It's just that they'll say, well, I, I can't just be totally defined by one movement. I, I'm more than just being a member. So they, 
not everyone abides by the policy. However, the vast majority do. And whether you've got the star or the dove one, um, I think it's a matter of interpretation why Engina started it. Um, because he didn't lay down the teaching in, in a specific writing or in a spe specific tradition. I think what it, there's the element that you have to get the badge from Lechanyani. Okay. So this, be, because it comes from him and it's blessed by him and you've obtained it from him, it gives you a kind of protection as you move around. Okay. Protection against evil of all kinds, whether you're talking witchcraft, sotsis, uh, you know, malevolent Afrikaner policemen, however you want to define uh, evil. The badge is a kind of protection. And then it, on the other hand, it also, because you're wearing the badge out in public, it prevents you from doing things that are regarded as sinful. So for instance, a ZCC member wearing a badge is not going to walk into a bar and start drinking castle lager, okay? They're just, it's not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. You can't go into a shop and buy cigarettes and start smoking them if you have a badge on. It's simply, um, it's simply against the rules. So the badge on the one hand gives you protection and it also kind of gives you that ability to withstand sin however you want to define it. And then I would say, in addition, the badge promoted solidarity amongst the members, because if you were going walking around and you see someone with the badge, then that person is someone you need to go and greet and to at least introduce yourself or be nice to or gradually recognize that they're in the same community with you. Okay. And then I think even beyond, let's move beyond all these other important factors behind the badge. Over decades, the badge really became a way for ZCC members to gain an edge in the job market. Um, remember, Southern Africans were being forced by all kinds of laws to leave their, the place where they came from and to go work to make money. They were forced to do that. And so there were lots, always lots of Africans looking for jobs, but there weren't enough. So who are the people who are going to gain an edge in getting the, becoming a domestic servant or a policeman or generally speaking, white employers over time favored people with the badge on because they believed that they were more sober, more healthy, more trustworthy, more less prone to lying and to steal or anything. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but that was the perception. So the badge over time has taken on these multiple meanings, meanings, uses. And that's why most ZCC members wear it all the time. I, I don't want to say it's for one reason or another, but if you're a member in good standing and they find you not wearing it, you're going to face pressure from the people on top to wear it, um, especially at services or on your way to services. Uh, let me leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's very true. Like there's just that different perspective regarding the badge, you know. Some even goes to an extent to say that, you know, it's a symbol of wisdom. If you look at in the Bible, there are wise men from the east when they came to 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 the baby Jesus looking for him, they were led by, you know, a stars. So somehow they try to connect that to the badge that they are wearing. That's another and perspective there's, that I had. And there's multiple prophecies by Enginus about stars. Let's also put it to you that way. There's other prophecies which we won't go into. So the star has yeah, multiple yeah. meanings in, which is why one section oh. is called star and the other one isn't. I don't, I haven't prepared myself 
on these kind of things, but um, because the, the the there's too many variations in 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 some of them, but the star has multiple yeah. meanings. Yeah. So to the viewers out there, if you're a member of ZXC and uh, would love to just uh, get uh, some engagement with you uh, to see what you believe about the stars is. The, the, the views that we are portraying out here, true or not, I'll leave my number in the descriptions just to have a, uh, an exchange in terms of this, you know, uh, this beliefs and uh, theologies. But yeah, <clears throat> moving on, uh, I mean, it doesn't get easier. Uh, with regard to Mount uh, Tabahomu, you know, Mount Sinai, uh, yeah. Why is it so central to ZCC? I mean, we see a million of people during Good Friday heading to that mountain. Why is it so central to ZCC? And uh, if we look at the Bible, there's an actual Mount Zion there. Is it the same as that one? What's the difference? And also, are there maybe some powers that members inherit when they go to uh, Mount uh, Sinai? Okay, well, um, Mount the origination of Mount Zion in the Bible is simply that it's it's in Jerusalem, in the sacred town of the ancient Israelites. So Zion is is a hill, and it's where Solomon's temple was built. Okay, a highly sacred site. So it it's referred to in the Bible and in many biblical prophecies. Okay, so the question is. The question really is, is does the Zion in the Bible have any reference to modern day Zionists in Southern Africa? Okay. Now, the Zionists in Southern Africa believe that these verses in the Bible referring to Zion do refer that to themselves. Okay. So the two most important ones are, um, hold on. The two most important ones is, Revelations 14.1. Do you know that verse? Revelations 14.1 is one of the most important of the two that they refer to. And that one is the same verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses use in, in which uh, the Lamb of God is on Mount Zion. And there's going to be 144,000 followers who are selected uh, based on how you interpret this verse. Okay. And then... Romans 11.26 is another key one in which Rome, the, the chapter states that the deliverer, the deliverer will come from Zion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So beginning with Enginus Lechanyani, they the ZCC had flags, a white flag in which they inscribed or they sewed in the, the verses in the Bible which referred to Zion. And Verses such as uh, Revelations 14.1, Romans 26, and some others in the Old Testament referring to Zion, refer to a Messiah's coming from Zion. I assume that they referred to Jesus in, in the Bible, my reading of it. But however, for the ZCC, these are clear references to Lechanyani and Southern Africa. Okay, so that's, this is why the ZCC will believe there's biblical evidence for Lechanyani's calling to establish this church in Southern Africa. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. As we are engaging on this beliefs and theology, you know, seems like there's a lot of views, uh, not only within the church, but also outside regarding ZCC. So, with, with that, you know, like, uh, what, what, what would you say are the wrong assumptions that uh, non-members have about ZCC uh, and its members? Okay, just hold on. Um, let me, let, before I answer that, let me, let me go back to discuss the importance of Z Mount Zion or Tabasione, Mount Tabahone, it's referred to, or the the hills of Zion are what the ZCC maintains is that when God formed the earth at the beginning, he was there 
at Mount Tabahone. Okay, that's where he was when the earth was formed. It's a, it's a sacred place. And this was revealed to the Lechanyanis. Okay, so Enginus Lechanyani claimed he was born at Mount Tabahone. He was not. Uh, however, his sons were born right at the base of the mountain. So, and then there was this struggle that Enginus had throughout his life to obtain the property rights of a white farm, which was right across the road from the mountain. So he fought a personal struggle to buy this farm, which took him from 19, over 12 years to, to buy half of it. And then his son later purchased the whole thing. So there's the element of the personal struggle to buy the property next to Mount La, to buy the, the white farm. And then we have the fact that God, when he created the earth, did it at Mount Tabahone. That means that the mountain itself has a special property. And so when you go for the annual pilgrimages, it's believed that if you are pure in your faith and that you've confessed your sins, you can touch the mountain and be healed of your problems. Okay. Additionally, leaders, the leaders of the ZCC will go up the mountain, commune with God and sort of come down like Moses and they will deliver messages, healing and other benefits to the member having ascended and come down. So the mountain itself is sacred and the site of prophecies, miracles, and many other important events in the life of the church. So that's the role yeah. of the mountain. It sounds a bit similar to uh, the Muslim religion where one has to somehow go to Mecca, you know, once in their lifetime. So I think there's that aspect of it. But, uh, Definitely. Every, um, every member of the ZCC is expected. Yeah to go to one of the con there's two conferences a year to, but the major ones at Easter, but every, every ZCC member is expected to go, whether they can go every year or not, obviously they, mm. you couldn't get that many people there, but they're expected to go on a fairly regular basis at, and at least once in their lifetime, it's a, it's a expectation of being a member. Mm. So it is, it is, it is like, it's like a Mecca for the ZCC believer. And it's a place, it's a place where you can go and despite the hardships in your life, you can connect with something very basic fun and fundamental, which can uh, relieve your spiritual and mental suffering. It's where you'll come out renewed and refreshed if you go there. So it's a place of refuge, of healing, and holistic well-being. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, to to the question that you uh, said you would answer, and that is the questions of uh, the wrong assumptions which non-members have regarding uh, ZCC. Uh, from your research and how people, non-members, view the 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 sexy. What are some of the wrong assumptions that people hold about sexy and its members? Um, I think the major incorrect assumption is that that's been there from the beginning. Is that the ZCC membership doesn't really understand the Bible or read it? In other in other words, they're the members are assumed to be a bunch of robots who don't think for themselves, and then they accept whatever they hear with, with, on a very credulous uh, level. However, it's clear from the start that the membership, as uneducated as it often was, or even as illiterate as it often started out as being, has been a, a group that has been very clear in its insistence that it reads the Bible closely and a lot and that it follows it now some of the verses that i've cited dealing with mount zion 
I think most people would agree they're probably, they wouldn't believe that themselves. However, the ZCC is very insistent that the message of Jesus is true. And they believe in, in uh, confessing your faith, being baptized and following the word of Jesus. So the ZCC is definitely focuses heavily on the gospels. Um, and then again, in terms of the, in terms of their links to black South Africa, they use a lot of the old Testament where they view the Israelites as being a, a kind of a, a mirror image of the situation of current black South Africans. So they identify a lot with the Israelites in the new Testament and their struggles and prophets who like, such as Moses and many others, they identify with that, but then the central focus then is, is on prophesying through the use of the gospels. Again, the prophet, the prophecies that we discussed earlier is, is what makes the ZCC unique. Um, the prophecies that are monopolized and put out by the central leadership. Um, yeah. a, other thing, uh, one other thing I think about the ZCC that I think is, is a, it's a misconception is this idea that they there's something gangsterish about them and and threatening and that if you criticize them or they or you wrong them then they will hurt you and mm -hmm. this runs I, I don't know how many people have told me that i shouldn't do what i'm doing because i'm going to be killed and blah 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 um I should never go to Zion City because I'll never emerge alive, et cetera. I, I find this stuff to be a little over the top, honestly. Uh, uh, the fear of the power of Lechanyani has gone to the extent that no one wants to say anything about the church because then they're going to get killed or whatever. I, I don't know how, if a hundred people have told me that I, shouldn't do what I'm doing. And this, this is not a new thing. It, it's been going on forever. So I, I, I kind of uh, think, I think it's time to get rid of that, <laughs> this kind of irrational yeah. fear of the organization. Yeah. I mean, you see this in, 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 in the sexy C members, like whenever you want to talk about their churches or so, it's, they just run away from them, especially if it has to do with internet, you know. I, maybe that explains why they, they, know, they don't want to engage in such conversations which are broadcast online, you know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean, ZCC members are told not to discuss any church affairs or theology with outsiders, except with those who are seeking membership. So oh. in, in general, the group follows this these rules however there i don't know how many dozens of emails i've received from all kinds of zcc members telling me oh this is what we do this is how it works this is you know whatever uh i mean i've received messages in secret from many people but however in public i mean no one's going to really talk to you except on a very surface level. So yeah, that's, that's the nature of the group. You don't discuss business with outsiders ever. If you do, no. your local congregation leader will hear about it and you'll face sanctions of some yeah. kind. Yeah. yeah. Since, since you are someone who knows a lot about ZCC, I mean, you have knowledge maybe which most members of the ZCC do not have. Would you please help us to understand about uh, the faith healing, uh, starting from the early ZCC, uh, how big was the faith healing during those times? I mean, even today, when you, you follow ZCC groups on Facebook and stuff, there's a lot of, of topics and uh, discussions about just faith healing. So. How, how big was faith healing in the Elie Zexus uh, church? Could you also touch on their views in terms of uh, traditional and uh, Western medicines? What What's their view with, with that? Okay, well, 
first, let's say you have to look at this, let's say before 1960 and after 1960. Before 1960, ZCC members were not allowed to seek any medical attention from Western doctors or from traditional African doctors or Dingaka or however you want to call Sangoma, whatever. So both Western and traditional medicine were banned. So you had to only use faith healing um, for your ills. Now, the problem is if the church is scattered over, you know, thousands of kilometers, how do you seek healing from Lechanyani? You, can, you can't go to him if your leg's broken, correct? So you had to, you, 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 you had to have Lechanyani blessing water, other things that could be sent to the congregations. Therefore, if you're ill, then you can receive a healing from Lechanyani, even though he's not there. And then ZCC members would also pray for you as well. So, I mean, the Lechanyani say that there's no illness that their prayers cannot heal. That is something they specifically say. So if you can't be healed, it means you don't have faith or you haven't confessed your sins or you're not, yeah, you're not paying your membership dues. You're not in good standing with the organization. If you're in good standing with the organization, if you have faith and you're confessing your sins, then you should be healed. No ifs, ands, or buts. Okay. The vast majority of people who joined ZCC from the beginning is due to faith healing. Okay, that is the number one method by which they recruit members and which they always have. It's there, but in doing that, they're no different from the Pentecostal organizations Pentecostal. that Lechanyani came from. It was the exact same thing. So the apostolic faith mission, which Lechanyani was part of, was the exact same thing. You recruit by faith healing. You, you find people that are suffering. You pray for them. You give them comfort. And a lot of times, poor, desperate people who are suffering are going to get better under these conditions or believe that they're getting better. That's a common human response to receiving compassion and care, especially when you're in a terrible situation and there's no one to help. It's amazing how much better you can feel if you receive that compassion. And, and so... You know, how many people are actually healed when you pray for them? It's actually quite a small number, but if you're doing this over and over, you can generate quite a big following if you're successful at it. If you know how to do it in a way that will, could, that will enable people to feel better. So the ZCC has basically converted a lot of people through faith healing and then has been exceptionally good at keeping those members and their children to be part of the organization, which is how it's grown so heavily over time. Yeah. Um, and then the, you also have the factor that Enginus Lechanyani and especially Edward were seen as people who had incredible abilities to heal, to heal others. And then you have let's say factor in also the annual conferences where you can touch the mountain and be healed. Faith healing, faith healing is always been at the core of ZCC conversion always. I mean, also with, 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 with that, uh, is it true that drinking alcohol is considered a sin? in, in ZCC, like if a member just have a sip of wine, beer or whatever, uh, that is prohibited to within the Correct. doctrines of uh, ZCC. Absolutely, because, you know, the people who inspired Lechanyani were also believed that. So, yes, yeah. drinking, smoking, oh. engaging in witchcraft, these are all major sins, lying stealing these are all people who are said to do that are not following uh jesus's commands and therefore they should fear for 
the wrath of God if they do them. That's not how Jesus told you to live. So instead, you should live a healthy life. And ZCC members drink coffee, tea. Um, they don't do drugs. They drink coffee, tea, and they are, in a sense, kind of like Christian science, uh, the, uh, what's it, Christian science, and a few other Christian sects, they, they have a kind of, or even the Mormons, they have kind of a lot of dietary emphasis that they're expected to follow in general. It's not really that unusual. Um, although the unusual part, I think, is that things like coffee and tea, they're expected to buy from the church itself rather than just go buy it in the supermarket. I think that would be the difference. Yeah, so also going back to faith healing, since you said that, you know, like uh, the church attracted and is attracting a lot of uh, people through faith healing. My question to that is that uh, as I was reading your stuff, I think you mentioned that, you know, uh, the only way for you to be healed, it is only through the church. Anything outside of that, whether it be through tradition or whether it be through Western medicines, that is also a sin. So right now, a current member of his ecstasy should not, and it's prohibited for them to visit Dr. Kumalo or Okay. No, no, it hasn't. It, this prohibition fell away. In oh. it, it, no, that's not the case anymore, really. Like the head of the Zimbabwean said, CC told me, he said, Hey, if somebody comes to me with a broken leg and asks me to pray for them, I just tell them to go to the hospital and get to get their leg fixed because I cannot fix that. Okay. Yeah. Since about 1960, and I don't believe there was any specific memo or anything, yeah. most of the Zionists have come to accept that you can go to hospital, okay? And oh. you, and some can get, and there's a, there's, you are, you're, if you get vaccinated now, there's no problem with that. You have to understand that it, this was also the same thing with the apostolic faith mission was the exact same. They did not go to any doctors until about 1960, and then suddenly it was okay. So within the ZCC and, and this apostolic faith mission, which it came out of, they both had this thing where like the first generation of believers would not go get anything. And then the subsequent generations started to see no problem with it. And I think another problem that the ZCC and the AFM had was that they lost members by insisting that they could only be healed through prayer. There were many people who left because they needed to see a doctor. And when they went to see a doctor, they got better. And they said, I don't believe this ZCC thing anymore. And they just left. So it's probably, I don't know if it's a question of the, it's a question of a new generation of believers just not being as fervent as the first, or if it's a recognition that insisting on this was going to lose them people. Mm -hmm. It's probably a combination. Yeah, that's, that's the wrong assumption that I had about, you know, uh, the, the members of the exorcists that they should. No, don't get me wrong. In apostolic yeah. faith mission or said CC, there will be some who will not do anything except receive prayer when they're sick. Don't get me wrong. There are some, but that's yeah. not the, that's a, a hardcore minority. Let's just put it. I, I doubt it's even more than 5%, but there will be some. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, uh, as we close, uh, today's video, today's interview, I mean, let's close this, let, let's close this with the biggest question. Uh, that exists or that I think is the most important. And that is the role for the role which Lekhanyane has within the Zexasi theology. How, who is he within the Zexasi? Is he some sort of an angel? Is he divine? Or is just a mere man like myself and you? Uh, how do members regard him in terms of uh, who he is within the Zexasi? 
Okay, what, what I'm going to do is try and answer this using the words of the ZCC in the 1950s. Okay, because mm -hmm. that is the time when they actively engaged the press. All right. And these are statements that were coming from Edward or even the people who'd give speeches just before you talk. This is the kind of thing they said. Um, Lechanyani is our God, the same way the nation of Israel once called Moses their God. I don't think they mean a deity there, like a prophet. Okay. Uh, here's another one. The guy, a person introducing Lechanyani to a huge crowd, he said, we are not afraid to call Lechanyani our God because he takes care of all of our worries. Here's another one. Lechanyani came to earth to free the people of God i.e. black South Africans from the grasp of darkness and ignorance. So there's this sense in the ZCC that Lechanyani is special. He was sent by God directly to South Africa. And that, well, let me say, let me give you one more. ZCC believers see the greatness of God through Lechanyani. ZCC believers see the greatness of God through Lechanyani. So what we're seeing here is he's a prophet, he's a messiah, he has the ability to communicate with God and no prayer made by Lechanyani can really be thwarted by anything earthly. So in other words, this family is different and they mediate between the believer and God. Okay. I think this is the crux of the matter for me with ZCC is there's a wholesale rejection of Protestant teaching as begun by Martin Luther 500 years ago. Martin Luther broke with the Catholic church because he said, there can be no mediator between man and God of any kind. You, if you believe, then God can deliver you grace. Correct? With the ZCC, the, there is a wholesale rejection of that, of Martin Luther and this 500 years of Protestant tradition. The ZCC is saying something totally different, which is, Lechanyani is the, he's a prophet and a kind of a liberator for an ex extremely oppressed group of people. He is a prophet and a liberator who is going to enable you. His actions, his prayer, his mediation will enable you to be saved to, to and to live a good life now. It's not only about heaven, it's it's about thwarting evil around you. It's about being healthy. Mm -hmm. It's about being, having this holistic uh, wellness about you, that you'll be in touch with your community, with your ancestors, with your own tradition, but it's all, and with God, but it's all mediated through Lechanyani. I think that's, really the crux of the matter with the ZCC. If you come from a Protestant tradition, you know, whatever, Anglican or Lutheran, you could just name Presbyterian, what the ZCC is preaching is, is anathema. Okay. But, but if you the, man him, but the man himself, Engenasi uh, Lekhanyani, did he elevate himself to such a status or it is only the members who were saying these things? Or no, it's the members who right? oh. No, the members will give Lechanyani this yeah. deification. Lechanyanis themselves never said that they were anything other than vehicles to pray for the members. Prayer being 
vitally important to the whole organization. That's what they spend most of their meetings doing when they're not dancing or, you know, listening to scripture. <coughs> so the, prow the prayer of Lechanyani is more potent than that of any other Christian in the world or in any other ZCC member. It is the prayer of Lechanyani is the focus if, and it does more than what anyone else does. And it also provides this all encompassing protection that you have in your life against all kinds of misfortune. So mm -hmm. when you become a ZCC member, you're, you're, you're placing yourself under this umbrella, this umbrella that the church says will give you the discipline, the, the ability to live a much better life. That's what, that's what it's all about. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Morton for today. I think, uh, let's, let's, let's end it there. Uh, I think our last video will have to shift towards uh, how, you know, the church is divided into one being one of the star and also the dove and the death of Agnes Lichanyan. And then we'll look into uh, his, his, his son, uh, someone who was quite uh, influential in terms of spreading and growing the ZCC, and that is uh, Edward uh, Lichanyan. So we, with that, we have come to the end of the video. Just remember that uh, the interview, uh, part one, and also this part was based on this book. Uh, as you can see the author there, it is Dr. Barry Morton. Uh, it goes deeper to the issues that we try to give an overview here in terms of all the theologies, the beliefs and all of that. So with that, Dr. Barry Morton, Thank you so much for today. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Pleasure, Percy. Thank you. Thank you. To our viewers, as I said uh, during the, uh, the, the video, that if you are a ZCC members, do contact me. I'll leave my uh, numbers in the description just to interact and find out if these things are true and what are your perspectives in terms of, of the star? What are your pers perspectives in terms of uh, is it divine or is it just a mere man like myself and you? With all that, bye-bye.